Okay, how many people have been to Soul Cycle or know someone who has been to Soul Cycle? The in, almost, we got a woohoo. Not, not enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, for those who, who haven't been to Soul Cycle or, or don't, or have heard of it and don't really know exactly what it's about, I want to read a blurb from some of your literature, Melanie. Great. Soul Cycle instructors give guide riders through an inspirational, meditative fitness experience designed to benefit the body, mind, and soul. Set in a dark, candlelit room to high energy music, our riders move in unison as a pack to the beat and follow the cues and choreography of the instructor. The experience is tribal, it's primal, and it is fun. For you, Melanie, as a CEO, what is it as a business? What, what are the goods and services that you are providing for people to consume? Yeah, so thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be chatting with a fellow <laughs> Brown alum. Um, so what we really provide in our studios, and today we've got 82 studios in 14 markets across North America, and what we create is this live experience. You know, people come to us, we say, for the workout, but what they stay for are the breakthroughs they have on the bike and the connections they make in the lobbies of our studio. So for those of you who've ridden with us, you, you know we've got 2,500 square feet, and our riders come in with this great sense of anticipation about the workout they're going to have, and they have these very natural collisions with the 60 people that are coming out of class that have just had this fun, tribal, communal, physical experience. And what that creates is this alchemy in the lobbies of our studio where people are open to new possibilities, open to making friendships, connections, business relationships, and it just breeds this really nice community element in each one of our studios. So again, we say that people come for the workout, but they really stay for the community. You go for the workout. You are one of those CEOs who makes sure you are in touch with your product. Can you tell me a time that you went and took a class and you came out and thought, oh, we are killing it on this, <laughs> and another time that you went out and said, oh, we need to tweak this. I think some of my favorite memories are when I go into a new market and I talk to a rider after class and they come out and they grab my arm and they say, Melanie, you don't understand. You really just don't understand what SoulCycle has done for me, what SoulCycle really is. This is my everything. It's my sanctuary. It's my escape. It's my release. It's, it's fun. And I have these conversations over and over again, and it's so rewarding to know that, A, that we're having a positive impact on our riders' lives, but B, that we've been able to scale this into 82 locations around the country mm -hmm. because ultimately the mission is to bring soul to the people and to get the population moving. And so the fact that we've been able to do that on a grander scale is, is really rewarding. Um, when I've gone in, let's see, and, and things haven't gone as planned. I mean, I, th I think working in the studios alongside the teams, you know, I'm in the studios six, seven days a week, mm -hmm. um, you can spot pretty quickly if something is not going to plan, and I think the, one of the greatest attributes of this business is we have the most incredible people. Um, we are a culture of yes internally before anything else, and we say there's a yes in every interaction, so if you didn't get the bike that you wanted in a class, we're gonna find a yes for you and get mm -hmm. you on that bike the next time you come in and ride, or if you didn't get off a wait list, we're gonna make sure the next time you come in, you're top of that wait list, and I think pretty consistently our teams are finding those yeses, but I'm always more than happy to, to jump in and find one with them. Let's telescope out a little bit. Boutique fitness is a growth industry. Between 2012 and 2015, it grew 74% as compared to traditional fitness, which only grew 5%. Why do you think boutique fitness is, is such a growth industry? Yeah, it's been really interesting. So our company is 11 years old, and we were really the first mover. When our, our founders created SoulCycle, there wasn't a boutique fitness industry, and, and they created something that they couldn't find in the market for themselves. And, I think what's happened over the last 11 years is people have seen the success of what we have created and have started to create either similar concepts to ours in indoor cycling or other modalities as people are looking to get you know, more fit in their lives and move in different planes and, and, and have different workout experiences. So you know, I think this ultimately speaks to uh, a couple of big macro trends that are happening. One is that the population of this country is looking to get healthier and looking for more options. Um, secondly, I think people are looking for personalized experiences. Mm -hmm. They want to know when they're going into, whether it's a retail store or a, a fitness offering, that it's going to be the best of the best. Um, and third, we've got the a very, very connected population of people. We are all on our phones. I see you all. We're all on our phones all the mm -hmm. time, right? And what SoulCycle does uh, is really give you an opportunity to put your phone down and to disconnect for 45 minutes and immerse yourself in an experience. And I think that's one of the reasons why we come into these markets and people say, oh, we're so happy that you're here. We've been waiting for you for so long. But the other reason why I think some of the boutique offerings have proliferated is because they are the best of the best and they give people that disconnection. Part of your business model is there's no membership. How does that work and why does that work? Yeah, so when we, we started, as I said, there really wasn't a boutique fitness industry and, and the way that it works now, it's all paper class. 
And so what that really does is put the onus on us to make sure that when you walk in the door and you've paid your $30 or your $34 for class, that you're going to get the best experience possible and also that this is the best use of your time. You know, people ask me about competition all the time, and I always say what we're really competing against is people's time. We all have a lot of choices about where to invest our time, whether that's with friends or working out in other places or just on Netflix watching show after show after show. And so we need to make sure that we're delivering great value. And so for us, what the paper class model really does is hold us accountable to ourselves so that we do it better each time. When I put hashtag SoulCycle in Twitter to see what people were writing, a lot of people were writing about having that communal experience and this is my religion. There was one that stuck out in my mind, and you mentioned something about it, so I'll bring it up now. It said, I cheated on SoulCycle with Flywheel because girl got to pay bills with a Z. <laughs> and you mentioned it's $34 a class. Why? You know, I think it's, it, the, when the business started, uh, we were $26 in New York, and you know, we've increased price over time, and as we've gone into new markets, we've been sensitive to the fact that New York is New York. Mm -hmm. um, so we're $30 in some markets, we're $28 in some markets, we're $26 in some markets. But we really think that you value what you pay for, and when you pay for an experience like that, you're gonna bring your best self to that bike, and you're gonna bring an energy into that room, which is really part of the collective achievement. You know, we always say that riding in unison with 59 other people around you, you're going to push yourself harder than you even knew possible. And that's where you're really going to see the change in your lives. And I think that paper class model is part of that whole experience. Millennials. Millennials are obviously a big part of your audience. And I'm wondering, you know, as they grow older, are you going to have to shift? You have to think about Soul Cycle five and seven years down the yeah. road. You know, are you going to stay in the model of youth and energy, or do you think you will shift and will it be Soul Cycle Stretch and Soul Cycle Senior? Or are you going to stay with what Soul Cycle <laughs> is, or are you going to grow with the, with, the, with the population? Yeah, I think it's one of the biggest misnomers about the company is that it really appeals to a very wide demographic range. So we have Teen Spin that sells out a couple of times a week in a lot of our studios. So you've got 14 year olds coming in after school as a social activity as much as a fitness activity. And then we have riders who are well into their 70s and 80s who've been riding with us for 10 years. And the reality of fitness generally is there's only a handful of ways to get cardio, right? You can run, you can swim, you can box, and you can cycle. And cycling happens to be something that you can do for a long period of time in your life. Mm. It's really easy on your joints. It's totally customizable through the resistance knob, and you can really push yourself as hard as you want through the workout. So what we see is that people are actually staying with us for longer than we had anticipated, and they're able to take it at their own pace. I always say to people when they're new, oh, I can't do that, or I have to get in shape before I come to Soul Cycle. I always say, we ride in the dark to candlelight. That's what makes it such a magical mm. experience. And so when you're new, just take a bike in the back in the corner. No one's looking at you. They're, the, believe me, the people in the front row want to be looking at themselves. They're not looking at you in the back row. <laughs> I went and I took a class on Monday, and I put on my, my journalist hat while I was in there. And you had a great instructor, I told you. And you knew who he was right away. Francis. Francis. Francis, super cute, really hard class. Um, <laughs> I, two things I did notice, people are actually very attentive. I think that's the people who worked at SoulCycle were very attentive. But I did notice he said SoulCycle and I counted 17 times. Perfect. Well done, well, Francis. Tell me why that's perfect. <laughs> Is that part of the training? You know, our training is, is fairly extensive um, for all of our instructors. We have 300 instructors now across the country. Um, and what we really do train them to do, we say we follow this model of freedom within a framework. So there's a way that we ask them to lead a soul cycle class, and there are certain elements of the physical workout that we want them to bring to life. But then how Francis leads his class is going to be really different than Jonas's class or Jared's class or anyone else's class because it's their individual authenticity they're bringing to that room, meaning it's their playlist, their music, their inspirational message. We don't ask them to say Soul Cycle 17 times. He obviously was so moved to share <laughs> where he was and make sure that everyone knew where we were. But I've been in studios before where they'll just say, let's go West Hollywood, come on, push, push. So it's really up to them. And I think that one of the reasons why we've been able to grow in the way that we have is we don't try to micromanage every little detail. We set these guidelines and then mm -hmm. we let people sort of operate and be who they want to be. And another thing that's interesting, I think, about your, your business model is that a lot of fitness instructors bounce around from place to place to place, but you want to really offer people the chance to have a career. Yes. 
what do you do? How do you keep people in career mode versus oh, I'm going to do this for a year or two and then I'm going to bounce over here? Yeah, from the beginning, actually, our, our co-founders really believed that they, they saw what was happening in the fitness industry, that I instructors were having to hustle all over town to teach one modality here and one modality there. And they believed that we should give instructors a home and a place to build not just their own brand and, and our community, but also their own career with us. So the, the, the simple things that we do is we give them a, a full-time schedule and benefits and 401k and paid vacation vacation and retail allowances, but I think what has really um, differentiated us is that we give them career trajectory. So we're very committed not just to upfront training, but ongoing training and development. We're very open to giving people roles in corporate um, in our HQ team to work on training, scouting, mentoring other instructors. And so when we really invest in our instructors as the individuals and show them those paths and opportunities, mm -hmm. it becomes more of a lifestyle than it is even a job. I read somewhere that when someone's applying for a job, you often take them to a class. <laughs> what is it you're hoping to discover when you take someone to a class who wants to work in the Soul Cycle? So I was, family? I learned a long time ago um, from a boss that I had way back that before you make a really important hire for your team to take them to a meal because you're going to learn more about how they treat wait staff, how, uh, what kind of manners they use, who they are when maybe they get a drink into them uh, before you make that commitment to, to hire someone. And culture is so important to us at SoulCycle and being in the studios, as I mentioned, is so important mm -hmm. to me that so much better than a meal is taking someone for a class. You can sort of see how they interact with the staff. And I have no expectations around the physicality of the class. I may ride in the front row and I, I very purposely, we don't ride together. I let them have their experience and I have my experience. But it's more around in the lobby, what happens with the conversation? How do they interact with the front desk? How do they interact with the instructor? Because what the, the culture that we've tried to build, especially in our HQ office, is that we're, we're ultimately in service of our front desk um, and our frontline teams. They are the ones that are closest to the riders. And so really understanding how a new executive is going to approach that kind of interaction is really important to me. I'm curious about your philosophy as an executive. There are other cycling studios out there now. There's Swerve and Flywheel and Psych. Are you someone who just concentrates on your business or are they in your periphery? Um, both. I think that great leaders are very paranoid people. <laughs> and so we, we pay attention to what's going on around us. Um, and there is, as, as you said and, and, and I said, you know, the, the boutique fitness industry has become a thing. And so we do keep a close eye not just because um, of their competition, but are there interesting things that they're doing, different elements of the workout or um, you know, different things that we should be thinking about in the studio design. Um, but really what we try to do is look internally first. And we want to make sure, like I said, we're doing it better each mm -hmm. time, whether that's a front desk greeting or how we're designing a studio or a feature um, in, a, in the class training that we do. We really try to one-up it every time, which is, it's hard to do when you're opening 15 studios a year, but we hold ourselves really accountable to post-morteming everything we do. We've got checklists for everything, and we want to make sure that we're always adding and evolving, and also discarding things that don't serve us anymore as mm -hmm. we've you know, continued to grow. So I think we, we keep an eye around us, but we mostly, you know, we, we hold ourselves pretty accountable. Fast Company named uh, SoulCycle as one of the 25 brands that matter, along with Tesla and Amazon and Airbnb. Um, what do you do to protect your brand? Is there any partnership you wouldn't engage in or? Yeah, I mean, I think our brand is an experience and our experience is delivered by people. So when I think about protecting our brand, it's really around our teams and just continuing to make sure that we are investing in culture, that we're investing in experiences, that we're investing in training and development, all for our teams, because they're the ones that are delivering those experiences. And you know, we're just coming off uh, today, actually, our first retreat that we led for 45 of our instructors, where we took them off uh, camping, basically, for two days. And to take 45 or you know, one-sixth of our revenue-producing revenue staff off of the schedule and put them for three days in a campsite was a big investment for the company, but so important. And so it's those sorts of things that we'll continue to invest in for our field talent as well as our HQ talent because that's really where I think mm -hmm. where I am most focused on protection. I know that you, I really have never seen a SoulCycle commercial, but you <laughs> are going to get into, into branding, integrative branding, right, for the first time? Is that coming up? We have never Mark. traditionally advertised um, the brand. 
What we did do is we created our first sort of campaign video this year that we put out on a lot of social channels to really celebrate what happens in the room. There's a lot of mystery around SoulCycle. You know, you, I'm sure if you live in DC or and you live in one of our markets, you walk by the studio and you see these really friendly people in this white, beautiful box and there's yellow and Polaroids and then there's this dark room and the door closes and you have no idea what goes on. And so the brief to the agency was, how do we bring that to life in a way that people mm -hmm. really understand? Not there's a bike and you clip in and there's music and lights, but what that payoff moment is, what that breakthrough is, why people stay with us. And so we uh, worked with an, an, an agency to create that video and really storytell, because I think the best campaigns now are telling stories, not just saying this is who we are. Um, and we'll you know, continue to put that out on channels and tell little micro stories as we, as we grow. Can I use the last couple minutes to talk about you? Oh, sure. <laughs> you, uh, it's something from um, Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In which I found really fascinating, and I think it mirrors your career. She talked about not doing the normal up the corporate ladder. She called mm -hmm. it doing the jungle gym. Yeah. You go from here to here to here. You worked for Virgin and, Ms. and Richard Branson. You worked for Starwoods. You worked for Equinox. Why did that work for you as a young executive, as a way to move your career forward? I think, um, so I've been really, really fortunate in that I have worked for these great brands and along the way, even more important than the brands, I've had great mentors who've really helped me move up the and around the jungle gym as I've gone. Um, I've just never tried to look too far ahead in my career. You know, people ask me all the time, did you always want to be a CEO and aren't you so happy you're there? I'm like, I, I've always wanted to learn and I've always wanted to do the best at where I was. I thought when I was the COO of SoulCycle, I had the best job in the world and now this is a new adventure that I'm on and I'm learning a ton and I think the more that, and I, and I advise our, our workforce and a lot of millennials as well, don't worry so much about being here, worry about are you getting the most out of where you mm -hmm. are? Are you learning in that environment? Are you asking great questions and are you absorbing? Because that's when you're going to be best positioned for your next step. I'm not gonna ask you about the work-life balance question. I'm gonna ask you how you feel about the work-life balance question. Because a lot of people <laughs> think it's the sexist question because female CEOs get it a lot. Yeah, what do you so think? I don't believe in work-life balance because I think that life is life and work is one piece of that. So I think that you have a pie that is your life and you have lots of different things. You have work and you're a mother and mm -hmm. you know I'm a friend and a daughter and I have fitness things that I'm doing and books that I'm reading. There's a whole bunch of things that I'm trying to fit into my pie. And so my philosophy on this has always been to just be as integrated as possible. You know, I, I say a lot, I bring my kids to the studios weekdays, weekends, I want them to understand what I'm doing. I bring work home with me, I, we talk about it a lot at the dinner table. Um, and I think the more that we try to stop separating everything and just acknowledge with technology, whether fortunately or unfortunately, we're always connected. So just make sure that wherever you are in that pie and wherever you are in your continuum, you're really present to what's most important. So when I'm at work, I am at work. I try not to get distracted by anything else. And when I'm home, my, everyone knows on my team, when I walk in the door mm -hmm. at night and I, I, I take a big breath and say, okay, Day part three begins and I put my bags down. I'm with my kids for that hour and there is no phone call and there is no text messaging. We're doing it, we're building blocks, we're reading books and I'm very present to that. And then I'm present to the next part of my day and I think one of the challenges for all of us is to just stay really present and focused and well-intended in those pieces of the pie because it's never gonna be as clean anymore as work and life. Melanie Whelan, thanks a lot. Thank you, <laughs> this is great. <laughs>